Okay, it's 12.16, so let's start. So today I want to welcome Meredith McGregor, our assistant professor, since uh, just a little bit over a bit before the pandemic, she joined us, uh, the APS department, in January 2020. And uh, her research group studies um, how planets are formed and also visibility of these planets um, using astronomical observations primarily. She has been her research has been featured in many public media uh, sources such as New York Times, Scientific American, you name it, National Geographic. And um, she, before joining and coming here, she was a um, Carnegie Institute postdoctoral fellow. And before that, in 2017, she defended her thesis at Harvard University. So welcome, Meredith. And um, today we're going to hear about how to form a habitable planet. I know. I got a round of applause. Oh my goodness. Okay. We'll see if this works, or should I move this? It's working? Okay, great. I'll stop touching it then so it stops making weird noises. We're good? Okay. Hi, everybody. This is a weird experience. <laughs> It doesn't feel like that long ago that I was here giving a job talk. <laughs> this is different. <laughs> I'm not sure entirely how yet, but we'll figure it out. OK. So um, I am excited to spend the next hour with everybody and share with you all what exactly I've actually been doing here for the last two and a half or so years that I've been on the faculty. So let's start. Um, I wanted to start by introducing my fantastic research group. Um, so this is a list of all of my undergrad, grad students, my postdoc, and even group alumni, because I've been here long enough that several undergrads have come in, done honors thesis, and graduated. So please notice all their names. Check out our awesome Zoom group photo, because I started here, and everybody started working with me in Zoom land. It was great fun. <laughs> In general, we use observational facilities to try and understand how planetary systems form and whether or not they might be habitable. So I threw up kind of three bigger picture questions on here that we try and answer as a group. Get into all of this as I go through my talk today, um, but this is sort of the overview. And you will notice I have tagged a bunch of my wonderful students in the slides in terms of the projects that they've all been working on so you know where all that work is coming from. Okay. So let's start with an overview of how stars and planets form. Since not everybody here is as enthusiastic about planetary systems as I am, this will give us all some context. So in our big picture of star and planet formation, right, we start with a giant molecular cloud up at the top. Pieces of that cloud become overdense and they collapse. They form new baby protostars, and those young stars are surrounded by disks of dust and gas. That's what we call a protoplanetary disk. So these are massive disks. This is when we have enough material to actually form our giant planetary systems. How long do these last? Somewhere between 1 and 10 million years. As we get more ALMA observations, we're realizing that this has to happen faster and faster. So we're forming planetary systems in a few million years. And then most of the material from these disks is actually getting cleared away. And what we're left with is our main sequence star, any planets that formed, and this sort of remnant belt of asteroids and comets, what we call a debris disk. So to draw the distinction between these different types of disks a little bit clearer, because I'm going to fade in and out of different types as we go through the talk today. On the left side of the screen, these are protoplanetary disks, right? This is all images from ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. This was a D-sharp large program. So these are all pre-main sequence stars, right? They are rich in primordial gas and material, the original material that came from these protoplanetary you know, planet-forming disks and clouds. We think this is the reservoir of planet formation. And on the right, things that are slightly older than 10 million years, give or take large error bars, are our debris disks, also imaged by ALMA. Main sequence stars actually have gas, which was a surprise. We didn't usually think that they had gas, because that's supposed to get cleared away. But now we have this picture where actually comets are colliding and they're outgassing, and so we get remnant material that's been processed. So I like to think of debris disks as the fossil record of planet formation, because you're grinding this material, and now you're getting a glimpse at what went into your planets, because you're grinding it back down again. 
So we can observe these disks, not just with ALMA, but across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Everything from the optical all the way through really long radio emission. And when we look at different wavelengths, we're actually tracing different grain sizes and emission mechanisms. If we look in the optical and the near IR, which is this top image here, these are all the same debris disks. This is AUMIC, an M star debris disk that's about 23 million years old. All the same disk, just imaged at different wavelengths. So the top is showing us our scattered light in this kind of near IR image from sphere. You actually see these waves moving outwards in the edge of the disk. This is small dust grains that are like micron size that are scattering light. The bottom three images are all in the infrared all the way out through the VLA, so longer radio wavelengths at a centimeter. And here we're actually seeing thermal emission. So the grains are getting heated by the central star. And now they're re-radiating just as a hot body sitting in a colloquium, but now around a star. And so we can see the structure change as we look at these different wavelengths of light. OK. But a lot of what I'm going to show you today is ALMA observations, because ALMA has completely changed how we look at planet formation. When I started my PhD, we took pictures of disks, and they looked like blobs. And maybe planet formation wasn't as exciting. And now, with ALMA, we have this kind of ability to image these disks down to 0.01 arc second resolution, which is incredible. We can look at 1 AU scales around nearby star forming disks. So here's the blobs that I started with when I began my PhD research. And there's some structure here. So a few things look like rings. Mostly, they look pretty unexciting. And here's the same disks now imaged with ALMA. So if you flip back and forth between them, you can see how things now have multiple rings. We see structures and asymmetries and gaps. And we're actually seeing these, planet from these systems form their planets in real time. And this gives us an entirely different way of trying to understand planet formation. OK, so that's the quick overview of planet formation. Now, I titled my talk, How to Form a Habitable Planet. So we get to chat about habitability for a little bit. Astronomers really like this very simple definition of habitability, where we say that a star has a habitable zone. And that's defined as, imagine I have an Earth-like planet. It's Earth-sized. It's Earth mass. It has an Earth-like atmosphere. Where can I move that planet relative to its host star that it will have a surface temperature that allows it to have liquid water on it? If I move it too close, right, like that planet that says too hot, it's going to be too hot. I'm going to evaporate all of my water. And if I move it too far away, everything's going to freeze. So we can define this Goldilocks zone, which is just based upon temperature, assuming an Earth-like planet. OK. That's a good functional definition. In an error where all we can kind of do is detect planets and get their basic information, that's about as good as we can do. But there's a lot of other things that influence habitability. And we can get a sense of that just even looking at our own solar system, where there are three planets that at some point in time have been or will be in a habitable zone by that definition. Two of them clearly are not habitable at the moment. So things must be more complicated. So we can start tossing down some other things that seem to matter when we think about habitable planets, right? We might care that it has an atmosphere, how fast it's rotating, can it have a magnetic field, does it have plate tectonics, what's the star doing? In our own solar system, Jupiter seems really important because Jupiter both threw a lot of comets and asteroids into our interplanetary system to deliver water, but it also then stopped impacts at some point by opening a gap in our disk and protected Earth long enough to have life develop on it. So there's a lot of other things that we can get at. And what I wanted to do in my talk today is start stepping through a few of these and say what we can do by looking at planetary systems in a broader sense, stepping away from the simple definition of a habitable zone and actually trying to answer a few of these questions. OK, so we'll start with two. What's the role of stellar activity? And what's the role of outer giant planets? OK, so first question we want to answer. Do other planetary systems have outer giant planets? That seems like a pretty basic question to ask, but we actually don't have an answer to this. So these are our main methods of detecting exoplanets that we've used to date, right? We have the radio velocity method, where we're actually seeing the wobble of a planet on its star. We have the transit method, where we're actually seeing planets transit and looking for blocking of light from the star. And in some cases, we have direct imaging, where we actually try and take images of planets directly orbiting their star. 
And on the right, this is showing the population of planets that we've detected. Certainly out of date because we're detecting planets all the time, but it gives you the rough idea of the types of planets we're finding compared to our planetary system. And if you look at this for a second, you might say, okay, there's a lot of planets here. They tend to be biased towards large things at the top of the plot and things that are close to their star. And if you look at our outer giant planets, which are marked here, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus, we aren't really finding anything that looks like that, right? This whole part of the plot is empty. And that's not super surprising. We have only known about exoplanets really since the 90s. So, you know, in 30 years, we wouldn't have even had enough time to watch Neptune transit because Neptune has a 40-something year orbit. We haven't known about exoplanets for long enough. But so long as we're operating in this you know, population statistics, we're going to have some misunderstandings in terms of putting our planetary system into context. So there's a way around this. Because planets like Neptune actually shape these disks. right? This planet like Neptune moving inside of a debris disk or a protoplanetary disk actually gravitationally perturbs that disk. And we can look for that structure. And the goal here would be that if we can resolve the structure and model it, we can actually place constraints on the planets that produce the structure. And now I can tell you something about Neptunes in other planetary systems. And to motivate that that's not entirely crazy, here's two examples where that works. Right? One is the Beta Pictoris debris disk, where we actually have now directly imaged the planet that's responsible for creating a warp in the inner part of this disk. And the other is our own Kuiper belt where the classical Kuiper belt is confined between the orbital resonances with Neptune, between the 3 to 2 and 2 to 1 orbital resonances. You can see that in the red and the blue points on that plot, where Neptune actually plowed outwards early in the solar system's history and sort of forced everything into these gravitational resonances. OK, so what does this look like when we look at other planetary systems? So I'll start with Fomalhaut, just because it's an especially beautiful disk. So Fulmahat is an A-type star, so it's different than our sun. And it's roughly 440 million years old, which kind of lines up with when we think this late heavy bombardment may or may not have happened in our planetary system. And Fulmahat was first imaged by Hubble, and it showed this gorgeous narrow ring with a possible protoplanet, Fulmahat b, orbiting on the inner edge of it. But this is an optical image, right? And optical light traces these tiny micron-sized grains. These things can get easily scattered around by stuff that isn't actually gravitational perturbations from planets, right? They can get blown by the stellar winds, stellar radiation fields. They're not reliable tracers of where the planets are in a system. So we observed this system with um, ALMA, and that's what I'm overlaying now. So this is the ALMA image of the FOMO hot disk, and I've put down a few markers on this to help guide your eye. So it turns out that the Fulmahat debris disk is eccentric, and it's eccentric enough that you can see that by eye. So the pink cross here is marking where the disk center would be if I just sort of drew exactly the center of this disk and I plopped a point down. And the orange there is actually the star detected by ALMA, and it's offset, right? So we actually can see that visi visually by eye, this offset that's indicative of it being an eccentric disk. The green side is marking pericenter, the part that's closest to the star, and the blue is marking the apocenter farther away. OK. Now, what was really cool about these observations is that if you squint and look at this, you might notice it's a little bit brighter at apocenter than it is at pericenter. And so this was a theoretical effect called apocenter glow that was predicted, but this was the first time we'd ever observed it. So if you think back to Keplerian orbital dynamics, right? which I'm illustrating here in this nice graphic. Bodies move faster in their orbits at pericenter and slower at apocenter, right? Equal areas and equal times. And as a result, we actually predict that there should be a surface density enhancement in disks that are eccentric at apocenter because everything is just spending a lot more time in its orbit there. So you should see this surface density enhancement. And this is what we actually see with ALMA. We see a totally different surface density enhancement at apocenter and pericenter. So what I'm doing here is these are brand new observations we got from ALMA. This is a different image. This is really high resolution data. We have about 1 AU resolution here. And it's flashing between apocenter and pericenter overlaid on top of each other. So you can see that difference in the width and the difference in the surface density profile. 
as a result of this. And what's cool is that we can even do better than just saying, you know, we detect apocenter glow. How nice, you know, this is a nice theoretical prediction. We're actually seeing now differences in the width as a function of azimuthal angle, not just surface density changes. And we can use that to really place some strong constraints on the planetary orbits, planetary dynamics, the formation of the system. Okay, so some disks are eccentric. Some disks have multiple rings and gaps in them. So this is a different system. This is HD15115. And again, I'm showing a Hubble image. And the Hubble data for this was particularly striking because it showed this asymmetry between the two sides of the disk. So if the left side of this image is actually truncated versus the right side, the disk is almost twice as long on one side as the other. And it was pretty unclear what was causing that because that's a weird thing to see in a planetary system. So we went and imaged it with ALMA to try and trace where these larger grains are, really understand the structure of the system. So this is now ALMA overlaid as contours on the Hubble image and then just shown separately on the right side. Surprisingly, we actually don't see the same asymmetry in the ALMA data. Instead, this disk has a gap in it. And I realize that this might be not immediately obvious because not everybody stares at disks. So this is my primer on what it means to look at a disk in space. <laughs> So we have a face-on disk, right? It has an inclination of zero degrees. That's our nice sprinkled donut. If you pick a line of sight anywhere through that donut, you're looking at the same amount of donut all the way through. So you'd expect to see even contours of surface brightness, assuming optically thin, right? This is an optically thin donut. Now if I tilt this donut and it's inclined, say an inclination of 90 degrees so it's totally edge on to your line of sight, if I pick the line of sight right through the middle of the donut, right, I go donut and then hole and then more donut. But if I go on the edges, it's donut all the way through. So you actually predict that you should get what's called a limb brightening from looking at these disks that have gaps in them. You should see it brighter on the edges. This is what's called onsi. They're like this brightened ring. Okay. So if we go back to this image, the center is the star, and then you kind of see these two knots of emission. And those are the limb brightening from the inner ring and the outer ring. And then the gap in between them is actually a cleared gap. OK. We should have had donuts as snacks. <laughs> so in this case, we can actually use the structure of that gap, both its width and its depth, to actually place constraints on planetary masses. And we can do that both analytically and dynamically. So the top is just showing how we can analytically calculate from a width gap, you know, a gap width and depth, what the mass of a planet is. It comes out to be roughly 20% of a Jupiter mass in this case. And the bottom is actually showing dynamical end body simulations from a code called rebound, where we try and put a 0.2 Jupiter mass planet into a disk with the properties of this system and see whether it clears out a gap. And in fact, it does. This has an eccentricity of zero here. This now has an eccentricity of 0 0.06. So as you play with the eccentricity, you can actually have slightly lower mass planets open up different gaps. So there's some wiggle room in there. But we're actually able to place some nice constraints on the planet that might be creating the structure in this disk. OK. Now, some disks have both gaps and also eccentricities. We can get some pretty crazy looking systems. So this was a, a paper that we published just this past summer. Uh, we had a nice press release at the AAS conference on this. This is an image, again, with Hubble, which looks pretty eh, I would say, <laughs> of the HD53143 debris disk. And this system is really interesting because it's a sun-like star. So it's pretty analogous to our own solar system, just a little bit younger. It's about a billion years old. Now, the Hubble image does not look very good, and there was a lot of debate about what's going on here. What was originally claimed is that this disk was face-on and that it had like resonant clumps in it because there's clearly some non-even surface brightness in this image. And so this was the best interpretation. And this is now the ALMA image, which, as you might notice, is not a face-on disk. <laughs> in fact, it's actually quite eccentric. It's even more eccentric than Fomalhaut is, right? Again, the center point here is the star. And while I was kind of guiding your eye that Fomalhaut was slightly offset, this is really noticeably offset. So we see an eccentricity here of 0.2. It's about twice as eccentric as Fomalhaut is. And that's more eccentric than any other planetary system, planetary disk we've looked at. And again, we see this apocenter brightening at the top side of this image. Now, we do this modeling approach where we actually try and fit models to 
the visibilities, the raw data from the telescope. And that allows us to get at this geometry of the system. So what I'm showing here is one of those model fits where the data is on the left, and then we fit an actual eccentric disk model where we're actually plopping down orbits of about 10 to the 7 individual particles in this disk, calculating their orbits, and then binning them into a two-dimensional histogram to compare. We sample that onto the visibilities and then actually do an MCMC chi-squared analysis so what I'm showing is the resolution, the full resolution model, and then model image like the data. And then the residuals are on the right. So that is what you get if you take that model and subtract it from your data. And you might look at that and say, hmm, that actually doesn't look like a very good fit. And it isn't. We fit the outer disk really well, right? We can fit this beautiful outer Kuiper belt. But there are some significant residuals in the inner parts there. Those are six sigma contours. So we actually see quite a lot of emission from the inner part of this disk. What does that indicate? Why is there dust hanging out inside of this outer belt? So what we think is the case is that there's actually a second disk in this system. So this is an artist's impression. It's better than my actual data. <laughs> but what we think is happening is that there's actually this outer eccentric disk. And then interior to that is an inner asteroid belt. And you can see this kind of like, you know, two peaks. So again, think of the donut. That's the limb brightening. And it actually would indicate that that disk is tilted more edge on than the outer disk, which would have us now have a picture where we have an outer Kuiper belt that's eccentric, and then an inner asteroid belt that is tilted relative to the Kuiper belt. So they're not actually in the same plane, which is a really intriguing system. Something has to be in there sculpting this dynamically. And if things are going to start getting kinked relative to each other, that might indicate that there's been some more dramatic dynamical scattering that happened. So we're actually going to get new data this time, this year, with really high resolution. And I'm hoping that that will let us actually resolve this inner disk. And then I'll have a better image to compare with the artist's impression. <laughs> OK. So rings and gaps seem to be really common, right? Here's a gallery of a lot of them. And if I remake that exoplanet plot, but now I plop on colored symbols where all of the planets are that are inferred from these rings and gaps. I'm suddenly populating that entire part of the plot around Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus, and Neptune. So if we push on this, I think that the structure of these disks will actually give us a handle, a way to start probing that population of planets. And I'll make a teaser here that we just had a large program accepted by ALMA. So large programs are more than 100 hours of ALMA time. And we're going to be doing a survey of debris disks to look at something like 20 different debris disks in high resolution, which I'm sure will yield even more beautiful images that we'll be able to see interesting structure in, model, and tell you even more about potential giant planets. OK, a few more notes on disks before we change directions dramatically, right? There is another interesting thing that we can try and say about exoplanets by using disk structure. And that is actually by trying to consider the alignment of disks relative to their host stars. So in this kind of nice picture of planet formation I painted for you, right? everything forms in this disk. You expect your star and your disk to be nicely aligned with each other. right? Nothing too crazy has happened. But what has been discussed a lot for these hot Jupiters, these large planets that are much too close to their star, is that they might actually you know, form further out and then have to get thrown inwards. And those kind of dynamical things can produce misalignments. So if we were able to detect misalignments in systems, that might give us an insight into how these planetary systems formed. Previous work basically concluded that there were never any misalignments between disks and stars, and everything was fine, and you know, planet formation was nice and regular. Um, but one of my undergrads who just graduated this past spring for his honors thesis went and did a kind of cumulative analysis of all debris disks looking for star disk misalignments. And so all the red points on here are disk systems where we actually detect significant misalignments, where the star and the disk no longer seem to be aligned with each other. So it's not a definitive conclusion, but it certainly indicates that there is even more, right? We're not just looking for planets and disks, but now we actually are using these disks to look for planets and trace their dynamical histories. But of course, I have to highlight that it doesn't always have to be planets, right? That's a nice thing. I'd like it to be planets. But there's other things that can produce structure in disk. And so this was a, a project that uh, Anne-Marie and I have been 
toying around with, which is trying to take her inclination instability and apply it to other Kuiper belts. Because if it works in our Kuiper belt, then maybe it works in these exoplanetary systems as well. So this is an interesting system called HD61005. It's also nicknamed the moth because it has these like giant wings where you actually see grains being stripped into this wing. And we can produce structures that look like that through these dynamical instability models. So we're going to test this with ALMA this time around and actually get really high resolution data, which will allow us to resolve the wings better and say something about you know, whether those wings look like they're being caused by something like a planetary system or they actually are better explained by one of these instability models. And if we were able to do that, you can actually even place a dynamical age on the system. So again, getting a dynamical history. OK, abrupt turn from disks into stars because my research group works on so many different things. So stars, as many of you are well familiar with, are active. Even our sun is active, right? They throw out large bursts of both radiation, what we call flares, and charged particles, or what we call coronal mass ejections, or CMEs. And that's interesting from an exoplanet standpoint and planetary habitability, because those charged particles and radiation can impact the atmosphere of a planet. And they can actually get into the atmosphere and start ionizing and modifying that atmosphere. On Earth, CMEs produce wonderful, beautiful aurora that we get to see and you know, gape at. But they can actually do much more damage, right? These kind of flares energy can actually you know, dissociate things like water. You could potentially lose the hydrogen out of the atmosphere and slowly erode away your atmosphere over time. So in order to think about planetary habitability, we need to actually better understand flaring, because it's something that we haven't always focused a lot of attention on. So stars flare across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And to get a really complete picture of the physics of flares, we need multi-wavelength observations. And so I have this cartoon here, which shows you kind of the loop structure of a flare, right, where we have these magnetic field lines that are getting twisted and snapping and breaking and reconnecting, which causes this outburst of radiation. And this is tagging different wavelengths of light onto that structure, right? So our optical light is actually coming from what we call the foot points, where those field lines thread back into the surface of the star, and they get heated up as like a black body. Things like UV emission and millimeter emission are actually coming from synchrotron radiation, where you're actually getting electrons you know, spiraled along those magnetic field lines, and they're tracing higher up in the stellar atmosphere. So if you're able to look at a flare in all those different wavelengths of light, you get a much more complete picture. And this is our sun, actually, on the right, which is a tiny wavelength range. But even just in that small segment, you can see how the structure of that loop looks completely different looking at these different wavelengths of light. So I first got interested in stellar flaring by looking at Proxima Centauri, which is our friendly neighborhood star, the closest star to us. It's an M dwarf at one parsec, and it has now three planets tentatively detected around it. Proxima Send B, which is the potentially habitable Earth-like planet. Proxima Send D, which is a bit smaller and closer in. And C, which is a bigger planet a bit further out. And there was a paper that came out in 2017, before I came and gave my job talk here, that claimed they had detected disks in this system with ALMA. But they didn't take a very close look at their observations. <laughs> So the uh, ALMA observations are shown here in this three-panel figure. And they actually observed for about 10 hours total. So all 10 hours together is the leftmost panel, which shows a nice point source and you know, looks like you might have detected something. It's a bit in excess of what we think the stellar flux should be. And so that's why they interpreted this as dust. Right? The dust is getting heated. It's glowing. It's re-radiating. We're seeing this excess because of warm material. But if you look at just like the first nine hours of observations, you get the middle panel, which looks like nothing. And if you look at the last hour of observations, you get the right panel, where it looks a lot brighter. We can do better, because ALMA actually has a one second integration time. So we can split that all the way down into one second bins. And then you see that even in the last hour, the star is pretty much not visible, except for about two minutes, where it goes through this small series of hiccups and then this large flare. So not so great for the disks, but it was the first time we actually detected millimeter flaring from an M-dwarf. This was a whole new wavelength regime that we could look at stellar flaring with. 
And the question was, how do we then put that into context, right? Because it's cool to detect one millimeter flare, but I can't tell you from that whether that correlated with the optical, or that happens frequently, or even what's producing that emission. So what uh, I've been doing with my group here is carrying out these massive multi-wavelength campaigns over the last couple of years, where we go back and look at Proxima, and now many other stars, and we try and get every telescope to look at the same target together. So we did this for Proxima. We had about 40 hours of time with everything from ALMA through TESS, Hubble, Swift, and Chandra. And we're trying to do this again right now. Trying to get all the telescopes to stare at the same source is a scheduling nightmare. I have many stories about this. But the data that we get is really amazing. So this is from the first paper we published from the campaign. And it's the largest flare we've ever detected from Proxima. What I'm showing here is the multi-wavelength light curve stepping down in wavelength. So Alma is at the top at the longest wavelength all the way down to Hubble at the bottom, which is the shortest wavelength in the far UV. And then the right is actually zooming in on just the Alma data and the Hubble data together. So we get this beautiful flare. These are one second time bins. So the entire event lasts about seven or eight seconds. It's incredibly short. And in that time, the Hubble emission brightens by a factor of more than 14,000 and the ALMA emission brightens by a factor of more than 1,000. So it's a huge event. The optical data, which is in the middle two panels here, actually seems somewhat decorrelated from the millimeter and the UV. There's actually a delay, which is significant, between the peak in the millimeter and the UV and the peak in the optical light. And what was extra surprising is how closely the millimeter and UV emission trace each other. They go pretty much in lockstep up and down. Um, and I think this is really intriguing because the UV is really the state of the art in terms of trying to understand the impact on atmospheres, right? Because we need that high energy radiation that what causes the damage to atmospheres. But the only thing we can look at in the UV right now is Hubble. <laughs> and Hubble is old and hard to get time on. And it would be wonderful if there was a way that we could use millimeter data to actually say something about the UV emission environment of these exoplanets. And especially exciting because um, what I've had some fun collaborative talks on is that these CMB surveys are going to be doing all sky surveys in the millimeter all of the time for the next many years. And they're also going to detect a huge number of flaring stars. And it turns out that after we started publishing these ALMA studies of flaring stars, they all went back in their data and started realizing that the foregrounds of your CMB emission are actually flaring stars. And now there's all these flaring stars being detected by CMB surveys. Okay. So relying on, you know, digging back into that optical emission again, right? This is now a plot that's a flare frequency distribution. So it's showing kind of the number of flares as a function of energy or amplitude, right? So small flares happen really frequently. Big flares happen rarely. And the, this is showing all of the flares detected by the every scope and TESS. So all the flares in the optical wavelength from Proxima. And the green line is indicating where our May 1st flare is. And it's like way over on the tail of tiny things that would occur basically all of the time from Proxima. So while it had this giant outburst in the Hubble data, it is a totally tiny optical flare, which is surprising. OK. Now, with ALMA, we can get even more information about the properties of the star and the flare and the emission mechanisms because ALMA actually observes at a bandwidth, right? It observes across a range of frequencies and it observes in the XX and YY polarization simultaneously. So we can use that to get both a spectral index, how the flux changes as a function of frequency, and we can get a lower limit on the polarization of the light during the flare. So what I'm showing here is two previous flares, one from Proxima and one from AUMIC. And the top panel is just showing the light curve, so flux. The middle panel is showing that spectral index, and the bottom panel is showing the linear polarization fraction. And you can see, actually, as you go into the flare, there's a change in the spectral index and a change in the polarization, it looks like. And this is now this new flare. So we're actually starting to develop a population here, and they show similar properties. We see this change where the spectral index becomes steeply negative. And we see this change in the polarization fraction. So we think that this kind of supports the picture that there's probably the emission mechanism here is either synchrotron or gyrosynchrotron emission because of the changes in the spectral index and polarization. Uh, so now these figures are from a new paper that Ward, the postdoc working group, just submitted. Um, and I just wanted to highlight 
kind of the more we're getting out of this data set. So this is the first flare we've detected with Chandra and Alma. So now we're getting X-ray emission. So the light curve is over here on the left. We're actually seeing Chandra, LCO, and Alma. So you can see the relationships. Um, this flare is pretty interesting looking because it has a lot of little peaks, right? It's not this kind of big dramatic brightening and tail off. It has quite a lot of structure in here. And then the plots on the right are kind of highlighting how with flares like this, we can really start to now put this in context with other flares and actually our own sun, because this was a pretty tiny flare, right? This now is 40 milligansky's as opposed to like, you know, factors of 1,000. This is a pretty small flare. It's actually comparable to like an X-class solar flare. And so here is plotting the volume of emission metrics and the temperature, comparing this flare from Proxima to other flares from MDORFs and other solar flares of similar size. And then the right here is where we're actually trying to look at now the Goodell-Benz relationships to see, which is a well-known correlation between radio and X-ray emission for stars, to actually see how this lines up. And so what's interesting is that in quiescence, it seems to match, but during flaring, the millimeter emission from these MDORFs seems to be sort of anomalously high which is something we need to understand better, right? There's a huge brightening in the millimeter emission during these flares, and we're not entirely sure what the reason for that is yet. Now, it's not just MDORFs that flare at millimeter wavelengths, it turns out. Um, the plot on the left here is from Kiana Burton's paper that she's submitted as under review right now, which is actually showing three flares detected from Epsilon Eridani. We just went and looked at archival ALMA observations, and lo and behold, there are flares in them as well. So this is a sun-like star that seems to flare at millimeter wavelengths too. And then the right is actually HD 53143, that cool disk that has an inner misaligned disk and an eccentricity. Turns out the star is not well behaved either. Now this is a much coarser light curve because that's quite a bit distant. And so these are like, each point is about an hour of observing time, but we see this brightening in an hour of the star by a factor of several. And it was nice is that actually tests happened to be observing at the exact same time as we looked at this with ALMA. So for free, we got multi-wavelength data. And so the gray in the background is actually the test light curve. And we don't see a flare, which is maybe not surprising since I just showed you that millimeter and optical emission are kind of decoupled. But we do actually see this really significant spot modulation. And what was neat about that is that we are actually able to, because the star is in the con almost in the continuous viewing zone for tests, to actually fit that spot modulation and get an age for the star. And that's really nice because we want to understand how disks evolve over time. So now by using the stellar emission, we're able to get an age for the system and say a lot more about the disk evolution than we would be able to do otherwise. Okay, so where do we go from here? Because it's nice to just stamp collect cool flares, but we might want to say something more about habitability, right? I said I wanted four figure out how to form a habitable planet. So where do we take this next? So one thing is to actually think about atmospheric models, right? Connect this to atmospheric erosion, compositional changes. And we can even take this a step further and think about what it would do for life. And so what I'm highlighting here is actually a project that I have ongoing through the Heising Simons Foundation, collaborating with Laura Schaefer at Stanford and with uh, Aaron Engelhart, who's a geneticist at the University of Minnesota, where we're actually going to try and Think about the atmospheric changes, and I'll talk about that a bit more in the next slide, and then recreate those conditions in a lab and see whether UV light pulsed with the energies and the timescales of flares actually does real damage to RNA and DNA. For the atmospheric changes, what we're really interested in is actually oxygen, because oxygen is often talked about as a biosignature here on Earth, right? The top plot here is showing the rise of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere over prehistoric time, right? where that is tagged to the start of photosynthesis because photosynthetic organisms produce oxygen, so we get this rise in oxygen in the atmosphere. So people often talk about if we detect oxygen in an exoplanet, maybe this is an indication that there's photosynthesis, we have life on this planet. What's shown here is actually just a toy model of oxygen abundances in the habitable zone and you can actually pump up the oxygen level in an atmosphere entirely through flaring. The FUV emission from flares basically drives the atmospheric escape of hydrogen because you're ionizing, splitting apart things like water. Hydrogen is easily lost out of an atmosphere because it's really light. And what you're left with is a whole bunch of oxygen and ozone. So you can actually, we think, overproduce oxygen and ozone in an atmosphere 
just through flaring alone. So what we're trying to do is couple the real flare observations and energies and rates that we have from our multi-wavelength campaigns into atmospheric models and basically create template spectrum for all your JWST explant targets. What you'd predict their oxygen abundances to be, is that enough to explain the oxygen you might detect? Okay. So I already highlighted two things on this large smorgasbord of habitability topics, and I want to end by sort of pointing out two more that I think are very important and how we need new facilities to tackle them. So you might really want to know whether your planet has volatiles, what we call CHNOPs, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, the elements that are most common to life, and schnapps is just a fun word to say. <laughs> and you might care whether it has surface liquids like water, right? Because we think these things are incredibly important to life. But we don't really know whether they exist in these planet-forming disks, whether they exist in planet atmospheres. So this is a very complicated schematic of disks and planets and how planet formation happens. On one side, we're showing protoplanetary disks, the flared side, and where different ice lines might be in this disk, and you know, depth in the disks gives you different temperatures, molecules are freezing out in different places. On the right is our more evolved debris disk, where we see the outer Kuiper belt, you know, planets, inner sources. And I'm trying to highlight here you know, different wavelengths of emission. Things like ALMA are really great at tracing kind of long wavelength Kuiper belt cold material. JWST can do some things with disk and is going to do some really cool things with disk, kind of pushing inwards, looking at hotter material. But we're kind of missing a complete picture here. And one of the things that we don't have is something in between, right? We're sort of getting maybe the really hot material, we're getting the really cold material, we're missing everything in the middle. And we're also missing a lot of interesting volatiles. So ALMA traces lots and lots of things like you know, CO, or formaldehyde, methanol, really big organic molecules. But ALMA is completely blind to looking at water. It's completely blind to looking at atomic species. So we can't say anything about those from our ALMA observations. And if I just start brainstorming things I'd like to know, about planet formation, water, where water comes from, I might start throwing down questions like this. These are things I can't answer right now, right? I don't actually know how many disks have enough mass to form Jupiter. I just painted this nice picture of how planets can sculpt disks, and I can tell you the abundance of Neptunes, but if we actually straight up look at disk masses, we don't know that they have enough mass to form any planets at all. I'll talk about that in a little more detail in a second. We also don't know the timing of planet formation. We see structure really early, so it, we think that this means that we have to be forming plants fast, but we don't know how fast or how long we have material for this. And we really just have no picture of water. We've detected water in one disk ever. We don't actually have a way of looking for water right now. So we have no knowledge of how water is actually traced through star formation into planet formation into planets. So I just wanted to show kind of where we are and what we'd need to answer those questions. Right? So this is highlighting the fact that with ALMA, we try and measure disk masses. And to do that, we go and we take total flux measurements. And we say, OK, this disk is optically thin. So I'm measuring the total amount of material. I can turn that into a mass. And there's been a number of surveys with ALMA where people go and look at star forming regions and try and detect the disks around all the different stars and then measure masses. And if we do that, we find that almost no disk actually has enough mass to form Jupiter, pretty much at all. That's problematic. <laughs> Obviously, we can form Jupiter, right? We have a Jupiter, so <laughs> we must be wrong. Right? I, the only conclusion I could reach from that is we must be wrong. We're measuring masses wrong. And so what's highlighted here is one disk. This is TW Hydra, which is a very well-known protoplanetary disk. The bottom here, below the dashed line, are different measurements that people have made with ALMA of the mass of this disk. You will notice this is a logarithmic scale. So they span everything from like 0.5 
large masses to tiny masses, giant error bars, nobody agrees with anything, right? That's not great for understanding planet formation. There is something maybe we can do better, right? There's a lot of complication in here. Most of the tracers we use might not be optically thin, we might not be tracing the right material, things might be frozen out. There's a better tracer, which is something called HD. So HD is deuterated hydrogen, right? We can't actually detect hydrogen in disks, but we can detect HD. And HD then is, you know, the closest we're gonna get to tracing the large gas reservoir, which is hydrogen. So we think it should be more accurate. So the top above the dashed line are all measurements made with HD, because we have looked at this one disk with Herschel and measured HD in it. So we can do better for TW Hydra, although there's still a lot of disagreement, and the reason for that is actually that we're not radially, we're not spectrally resolving the line with Herschel. So in order to really get the mass, you need to look with a good tracer and resolve it spectrally so you can actually get the rotation and the location in the disk that that mass is, which gives you the temperature, which gives you the mass. So we need both measurements of HD, which are these two lines, and we need them with high spectral resolution. We don't currently have a telescope that can do this, in case that was not an obvious statement. Okay, so water, right? I already highlighted water. Water is inherited in this nice simple picture from the ISM into protostars, into protoplanetary disks, and then into our own solar system bodies, we think, right? But water is very hard to observe. So this is a plot that shows different energy level transitions of water, so the temperature of your water reservoir, and where the transitions are for water. So everything on the left is JWST, everything on the far right is ALMA, everything in the middle is the gap between the two of them. So JWST has access to exactly one water line, which is at something like you know, 800 or 900 Kelvin, so incredibly hot water. Alma has access to a very small handful, like six or something water lines, but they're actually all unobservable because Alma's on the ground and we have water in our atmosphere and the water in the atmosphere absorbs all of the water that you might be trying to detect from space. So we can't do it at all. And all of the water lines are in the range in between, in that space that is 30 microns to 800 microns. Okay, so if we want to look for water, we need to build a space telescope and look in that wavelength regime. And that's the only way we're ever gonna observe water anywhere in the universe. What does water look like? This is a simulated spectrum of what water might look like in a protoplanetary disk. And so it's showing all of that wealth of lines. There's also the purple, which is showing ice. Because one of the questions we actually don't know is how much is in volatile, like volatile water, vapor form, versus in ice. Because disks are cold places. And when we tried to do this with Herschel, we actually did not detect a lot of water. And one of the possible reasons is that it's actually frozen out. And so you need to look for ice as well. And a big question is even whether this inheritance that I just showed you even holds, or that the actual process of planet formation in these disks is completely reprocessing water, right? That, you know, we're not even, this is not a strict linear trace. We actually need to better understand that. Um, and so here's the kind of like highlight that water lines are really narrow, so you need incredibly high spectral resolution to do them. And they're all in this kind of far infrared wavelength regime. And the last thing I'll highlight here is we still have a big question of where Earth's water came from, right? We formed within the snow line for water in our solar system, so water didn't form here. It has to have come from someplace else and been delivered. And it's not clear whether that came from asteroids or it came from comets. And the only way to test that is to measure what's called the D to H ratio, which is the deuterium to hydrogen ratio, which is kind of like a fingerprint of where your water came from. Because you end up with some amount of HDO and some amount of H2O, naturally. And different populations of bodies have different D to H ratios. So comets and asteroids have different D to H ratios. And if we could better measure this, we could actually better tell where our water came from from Earth, right? And so to do that, HDO has the same kind of transitions as water out in the far infrared part of the spectrum. So what I've been spending a lot of time on in the last couple of months is actually, you know, 
instead of just using all the telescopes that are available, thinking about what the telescope is that we need to answer the questions that we still have. And I think the answer here is that we need something in the far infrared, and we need it to have incredibly high spectral resolving power, because otherwise we can't do any of these lines well, and we're not going to get useful information. Um, so this is a mission concept that we're going to be submitting to NASA in the next year called FIRST, which is the Far Infrared Spectroscopic Space Telescope. It's a terrible astronomy acronym. <laughs> um, but it would allow us, between these two different instruments, to get the resolving power and the sensitivity we need to answer all of those questions. OK, so I am out of time, which means I will end with these take home messages and just highlight the fact that we have come a long way in the last few years in understanding planet formation. And it's an incredibly interdisciplinary scientific topic to really say how you form a habitable planet and whether there are any. And I'm really excited to see where we go in the wealth of observational resources we have and are getting now. Thank you, Meredith, for this wonderful talk. Questions? Yes, please, Jeff. Uh, great talk. Very interested in what you're saying. Uh, just a couple of comments. One is the use of HD to try to figure out the mass and the uh, gas and dish is really interesting, but um, the, the material exists, of course, is relatively cool, so you can have a highly liberated HD, much, much different from the uh, primordial Yes. Yeah, so a few things. Um, so yes, obviously with HD, it's not a perfect tracer. So there needs to be a lot of thought put into using it well. And then as far as the millimeter mission, I'd say in general, what we seem to be finding now that we're getting a population of millimeter flares from multiple stars is that they seem to have very high flaring rates and very high luminosity. So if we plot like the flare frequency distribution for Proxima, for example, between the optical and the millimeter, they look like they're almost offset from each other in that there's just many more bigger flares happening in the millimeter compared to the optical. So yes, maybe that is unique to Proxima. We need to do this for more stars to have a better sense for what the underlying reason is for that. Go ahead, please. No, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so you're saying, do we have enough flares that have multi-wavelength coverage now to be able to get not just the energy out of them, but also a temperature? Yes, both. Do you have any that you can get both temperature and energy for? And if yes, do we have enough that we can do flare frequency? Um, we have a lot of flares that have multi-wavelength coverage. Um, the getting all of that information is a little tricky in that you have to fully understand the emission mechanism underlying it and how the wavelengths relate to each other. So, so far, right, I've just been quoting fluxes and luminosities for the millimeter flares instead of energies because we don't actually know the emission mechanism, which means I don't actually fully know the spectral distribution that's underneath that millimeter curve, which means I can't actually give you an energy unless I make stuff up. And so we've been not doing that. Um, we can certainly get temperatures, like black body temperatures, because we have tons and tons of flares that have you know, optical black body emission and millimeter emission. But uh, it's not immediately clear to me like, what the correlation is there, because there does seem to be some significant differences. So yes. Yes, we have a good, I mean, we have 
40, we're still plowing through things, but we have 40 hours of data with Proxima, so we have quite a lot of optical and UV matchup. So there is a solid sample of flares to kind of dig into and start to answer some of those questions. Um, we are doing a campaign right now to do four more of the nearby M stars. Um, so that will have some, it's been a little bit harder to coordinate, <laughs> but more, more data that is optical, UV, X-ray, millimeter. We have some Swift, Chandra, Nicer, Alma um, for four more stars. And then Ward just had a proposal that um, we put in that got accepted to do more, tw 20 hours per star for several more stars with Alma and Tess simultaneously during the next year. So we're building a sample. Um, and I should have said to you, Jeff, that actually with, if we assume this kind of gyrosynchrotron picture, we can actually use the spectral index from the millimeter to place a constraint on the magnetic field. Sure. And so we have done that for Proxima for at least that one flare, the big one, um, and we're trying to do it for some other ones as well. Because we can try and use the energies from the UV and test to actually narrow the scope of where the magnetic field strength is. People have to come. You <laughs> 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 Sorry, I cannot hear you. Yeah. So you're talking about this. Yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> I think we're, this is the very first flare that we've ever seen with the millimeter and the x-ray together from an MDORF, so this is a sample size of one, which means I hesitate to make any large <laughs> leaps in conclusions without getting more of them, but hopefully we will have that data soon. Okay, um, yep, go ahead. Oh, okay. So, so yes, we, we do see many circular debris disks. I would say most are probably more circular. Um, I sort of highlighted two that were eccentric because those are interesting to try and understand. Um, but we do see a lot of circular disks or circular as far as we can tell with our current resolution. Um, and you said gaseous, so I should clarify, right? Not all debris disks have we detected gas from. Um, we previously just kind of assumed that no debris had gas, and it's actually a new ALMA result that we've detected CO in disks. But almost all the detections come from really young A stars. If you actually like make a histogram of types of disks and look at where those detections come from, they almost all come from earlier type stars. And so it's not clear whether that's an observational bias or there's actually something different between, say, sun-like star disks and A-type star disks in terms of the amount of material that's left over and its gas properties. There's some disks that have so much gas in them that actually this collision picture starts to break down in that you would need to be smashing like a thousand Hale-Bopp comets together every month or something in order to produce the gas reservoirs that we see. And so then people start trying to toy around with the idea that maybe you can primordially like self-shield gas in disks and maintain gas reservoirs from the protoplanetary disk phase that don't actually get cleared. And one last question, since so it's 115. Disks and stars are misaligned. How do you get the inclination angle of a star? <laughs> Good question. Um, so that is basically uh, going through the test data and actually trying to like fit the rotation of the star itself. That is a fraught process <laughs> and there's a lot of actual work being done now to try and do better in terms of getting the stellar inclination angles. The disks are easier. Also, you, you, the stellar detections that you have in all your other disks, are any of those two photospheres or are they all flares? All those beautiful stars sitting in the middle of the disk. Yeah, I'm surprised to see 
Yes, yes, yes correct. It's surprising to see the millimeter emission. Um, for some of them, so like Fomalhaut, for example, that actually seems to just be stellar photospheric emission. Um, there is multiple other things that we detect. So some is probably flares, and we haven't gone back and looked for them, but I suspect that if you go look through all the ALMA archival observations in a time-resolved manner, you'll find a lot of flares. There's also chromospheric emission from stars in the millimeter, which complicates things. So even when we don't necessarily see a flare, we see the star brighter at millimeter wavelengths because you're actually moving towards a place as you go longer in wavelength, the chromosphere starts to become optically thick. And so you're actually tracing higher and higher and higher up in the chromosphere. And so you get higher brightness temperatures. So for Epsilon Eridani, for example, we see the flares, but we've also looked at it with ATCA, so seven, seven, seven millimeters, and you can actually see the brightness temperature of the non-flaring time changes between millimeters and centimeters, where you're actually like tracing that of the chromosphere, the shape of the chromosphere as you go up. So all of that is to say that stars are complicated at millimeter wavelengths, and anybody who tries to claim that an unresolved point source that seems slightly brighter than it should be is actually a disk probably needs to take a better look at their star. And unfortunately, it's 117. So let's thank Meredith again. <laughs> and if you have any questions, just come after the talk. <laughs> and ask Meredith in person.